All right, thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed connecting with one another. As you can tell, our panel is ready to go. I'd like to invite Pascal Witz to lead this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me start by reminding you that according to UNESCO Institute for Statistics, less than 30% of the world's researchers are women. Within the female population in higher education globally, same thing, around 30% choose STEM-related fields of study. The female students' enrollment is particularly low in information and communication technology, 3%. Natural science, math, stats, 5%. Engineering, manufacturing, construction, 8%. So not only is female participation in STEM education and employment low, the attrition rate is particularly high. Women leave STEM discipline in disproportionate numbers during their studies, whether it's from high school to college, from undergrad to grad school, and later during transition to the world of work, and even during their career cycle. According to the OECD, even when girls do graduate from scientific fields of study, they are much less likely than boys to work as professionals in this field. Now, if you think about AI, today everybody talks about AI. 22% of the world's professionals are female. Think about the consequence also in who builds the algorithm and what potential bias you can have. A quick note on female founders. 2.2% of founders of startups are female. They have access to also 2% of the capital. In venture capital firms, the decision makers are female in less than 10% of the cases. 74% of the VC firm have zero female. So, we have a very good example of great women who excel in their field. Their bio is so impressive that I'll be very quick, but you should read everything that they have uh, been uh, lead, leading in, in their own field. Um, so I'll start with uh, Carla Broadley, who is the Dean of the Curry College of Computer Science here at, North, at uh, Northeastern, an expert in computer science and machine learning. She's also a fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Um, Elisa Simon-Pietri, uh, is the science program director at the Fondation L'Oréal and the executive secretary of the L'Oréal UNESCO for Women in Science Awards. And then uh, next to Elisa, Jill Pfeiffer is the Elisha Benjamin Andrews Professor of Mathematics and the vice president for research at Brown. She's also the president of the American Mathematical Society, the only, the third woman in 130 years. Wow. And next to me, Susan Silby, who is the Leon and Anne Goldberg Professor of Humanities, Professor of Sociology and Anthropology, <coughs> and Professor of Behavioral and Policy Science within the Sloan School of Management at the MIT. I'll introduce myself quickly as well. I have the pleasure to be the moderator as well as a panelist today. Uh, I've been a global healthcare leader uh, for 30 years. Until 2016, I was an executive vice president at uh, Sanofi, uh, running the global diabetes and cardiovascular business. And before that, I was 17 years with GE Healthcare. The last five years, I was the CEO of a $2 billion pharmaceutical company that they had acquired. So, I will start with my first question, and I'll start with you, Susan, and I'll... Um, I'll ask everybody to uh, think about the same topic because we have very different um, uh, lens towards it. I'd like to have your view on the role of gender stereotypes in the orientation of female in STEM. And also to add to that, are they different at different stages? Well, thank you, Pascal. And thank you for the invitation to join this. Um, I'm going to speak from the results of research that I conducted with a team originally of graduate students who are now 
this has been going on for so long, they are now tenured professors. But um, we studied engineering education at four schools. Schools, two of which were innovative or claimed they were innovative and in trying to design a different kind of engineering education to produce a more socially responsible engineer. We began observing and interviewing these students when they entered college in 2003. We followed them until they graduated and we have a panel going of these same students that we have surveyed uh, in 2012 and 2017. So that's the data that I speak from. It is important to understand, I think, that engineering education is different than edu education in science and other professions. It is the only profession in the United States which can be earned, in which membership can be earned on the basis of an undergraduate degree of four years. As a consequence, the education in engineering is targeted and very narrow. There's a lot that the professorate wants to get into these students within these four years. And so I think um, looking at their education tells us a lot about the profession and the lives of engineers. Um, let's say one other thing about engineering. It is a field which prides itself on what it considers objective knowledge, not, not bias, not prejudice, not a subjective. And it regards, therefore, achievement within this as a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. And when you see that the basis of your field is belief in its objectivity and belief that it's a meritocracy, it's very hard to get members to critique it. Okay? So what do we know in answer to your specific question about the role of stereotypes at different stages. We know from our research that almost every student in our sample, which was originally 1,700 students at these four schools, um, they were good in science and math in high school. And they were identified as being good in science and math. And therefore, they were encouraged, and I think this is very interesting, they were encouraged to become engineers they weren't encouraged to become scientists. I believe there's a significant difference between being a scientist and being an engineer. Engineering is all about risk and control so that the product, and it's always a product, doesn't do damage. Science is all about uncertainty and not knowing. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different orientation. These young women and men, uh, were encouraged to be engineers. The second influence in their life was there was, if not, there was a member of the family, a father, an uncle, a brother who was an engineer, and they would often be tinkerers. So there was a clear theme in our first interviews as they entered college that they had done things with their hands. Once they entered college, they all were enthusiastic. They all were very good students, as I said. But they, like every person who gets accepted into schools that are selective, they start to sort. They get an exam. Well, they didn't do so well on that exam. Maybe they'll do better. And as they start to sort themselves by the work, well, some of them realize they're not doing as well as they had in high school. The men usually say, well, that was a bad quiz, or that professor is uh, unfair, or I was sick that day. The women, almost to a person, say, well, I began to think I'm not very good at this. Mm -hmm. And they blame themselves. To their credit, they often went for help where the men did not go for help. Mm -hmm. They went for tutoring, and they did fine. The next thing that happens in an edu engineering education is you put in work groups. And they have to learn to work in teams because that's what's going to be in their job four, five years hence. On the teams, very quickly, the women get relegated to management. 
They set up the times, they get the materials, they often become the spokesman for the team. How do they interpret this? They interpret it as the men are having all the fun, they are improving their skills, and we're doing the housework as usual. The next part of their education is, now obviously this is not all linear, but this is what goes on across the four years, they go into internships. This is a very uh, common part of engineering education. And in those internships, they have their first unabashed experience of misogyny, <laughs> unmitigated. The stories we have from students is, I showed up at such and such a firm, I was sent by my professor, I was told I was going to work in this group, and the first thing the guy does is tell me what to wear and not wear. Tells me don't show up in short skirts and don't wear low neck things. He's, the student says, I was wearing a polo shirt and slacks and a jacket. Why would he say that to me? But those were the lessons that they were given. The other part is that they're relegated again to secretarial jobs, to reporting, and do not feel that they are getting the same sort of technical skill. Now, they might have been, but their confidence starts to erode, mm -hmm. that they're not the same as the men. And what happens in these informal relationships, in collaboration very early, they begin to experience the gender stereotypes. And some of them say, and I don't want to do this anymore. And in the survey of all the students across the four schools, and this is an article, this is not self-congratulation, but it's just to show that we have passed peer review on all the statistics, they, all the women have a met much higher rate of saying, I don't think I can have a good job in this, mm -hmm. in this profession. They lose confidence that this is a profession they want to be in. But I, I have... So this is, this is uh, relentless, and I can actually think about some similar uh, examples in business, but I'd be interested, uh, because you have this uh, view on engineering, to hear about the graduates or to hear about people, uh, students in math and in computer science. So why don't you start, um, Jill, with Thank you, Pascala. It's a tremendous uh, pleasure and honor for me to be here, part of this important event. Uh, let me just start with uh, a few personal reflections. When I received my PhD in mathematics in 1985 at UCLA and started my professional career, there were very few women, not just in my field, but in all of mathematics. For example, as an undergraduate, I took many math and science classes. And as a graduate student, I took many advanced mathematics classes. I took only one class from a female professor in all that time. When I came to Brown University after five years at the University of Chicago in 1990, as a tenured professor, I was the second tenured professor in mathematics at that department, but still there were several top universities who would not tenure their first female math professor in, uh, for another 14 or, or, or 24, or sorry, 24 years. So today, um, so, so in the first 15 years th of my professional career, there were many positive changes. Um, but now, 35 years on, there, we're not as far as we, as we should be. In fact, data shows that the PhDs for women in mathematics peaked about 12 or 15 years ago at 32% and have slightly declined since. I just saw data that on the female bachelor's degrees in, in computer science and engineering, and there were declines between 2000 and 2015. On a more positive note, the last 15 or 20 years has given us a growing body of research, thanks to Susan's work and others, on, and, and research studies and data that clearly point to bias as a factor. I just read a thoughtful article in the Journal for Neuroscience, the September issue by Charles Worth and Benaji, and I, I learned that bias is found at very early ages in children. So clearly we need more research and work 
on finding effective interventions for bias, both at the individual level and at the organizational level. One of these interventions that has been studied is breaking stereotypes. And in my field, one of the stereotypes that we face that really creates a negative climate is something I'll call the cult of genius. <laughs> this is the notion that in order to, to do mathematics, you have to be some kind of genius. Clearly, there are singular achievements in my field, and, and mathematicians marvel at these results, but they are singular. This is not, this, they, they do not represent the, the working life of most mathematicians. So I, I would say that, uh, that, that the effect on, on gender is, is this. If, if one believes that, that in order to be a contributing mathematician, you have to be born with a special gift, that, that math can't be learned in the usual way, then, then if you look around and see very few women or other underrepresented groups, it will be more likely to question the individual woman who, who wants to be a part of this club, who wants to join this group. So I look forward to, to much more research and work in this area that will guide us to, to make the, these changes in culture and personal belief that affect all of us. So it's interesting because you're highlighting um, uh, a probable lack of self-confidence from the young girls or the young ladies to, uh, to study the field. So is that something that you observe as well? Um, uh, yeah, so let me start with a, a couple stats and then and then talk about why they've come to be. Um, so and and my stats are are, are um, North American centric. Actually, the stats are a little bit better internationally, particularly in Asia. Um, so, uh, twenty three percent of people who take the computer science AP are women. 19.5% of graduates out of undergraduate programs are women. And to go exactly to what you said, when I graduated in 1985, it was 40% women in computer science and in math at, at um, nationally. 26% uh, of people holding jobs in high tech are women. I think they're counting in a really funny way because most companies that I've engaged with, uh, if they really count the technical staff properly, it's between 10 to 18%. Yeah. 11% of CIOs are women, and 11% of C-suite and companies are women. Now, I mentioned that international statistics are a little bit better, um, particularly, in, particularly in Asia. It's about 30% women. There's something going on there that is worth studying. But the point I want to make is that when you come into a field where you're underrepresented, you're facing stereotype threat. Um, and it's exactly what you pointed out, that if a woman doesn't do as well on an exam, um, she really thinks it's about her. And what has been demonstrated is that the key problem in computer science is that women are not trying it. And let me make that really clear. There have been studies that show, as long as you don't put a jerk on teaching the intro sequence, <laughs> there have been studies that show that women and men and people of all races and colors like computer science in the same percentages. 75% of people who take that first coding class will go on to take the second class in the series. 75% of them will go on to take the third class. Typically, when you take the third class, you're either majoring or minoring. And that there is no difference between men and women enjoying computer science. You either love it or you don't, and you know it really quickly. The problem that we need to solve is that women are not trying computer science. So you could say to yourself, well, let's have it happen in high school. Well, there's two problems with this. One, we have to get um, the entire, at least you know, the entire world, but let's just start with, um, um, with the United States school system. You've got to make computer science required because if you make an elective, the stereotype threat will, will make them not take computer science. Even my own sons, all sons, I said, take some computer science. And they looked at me and they said, that is social suicide. And that is because <laughs> what has happened from 40% in 1985 to 19% now? 
the media got a hold of what is a computer scientist. Visualize, <laughs> anyone watch Silicon Valley, my least favorite show on TV? <laughs> the caricature of who we are are people who have bad social skills, who like basements, who like to be alone, and who don't bathe regularly. Um, I'm here to show you, I did have a shower this morning. I don't like the basement. Um, and uh, and I, well, I don't, don't want to comment on my social skills. Um, so there's a lack of role models that exacerbates this. And there's also a lot of implicit bias. And the implicit bias starts at the undergraduate level. We do a TA training because we do something where we have something called paired programming where two people work together, and that's throughout our intro sequence because you have to learn to communicate when you do computer science, so we're teaching them how to do it. We ran a TA training, and the question being postulated was, what do you do if one person in the team isn't really pulling their weight and isn't able to do it? And when people answered this, they used the pronoun she for the person who wasn't pulling their weight. And the person teaching this said, I never used a pronoun. And it was just an implicit bias in the back of their heads. Um, this happens higher up at the level of technical conferences in academia, where the keynote speaker is often never a woman. It's always a man. And I want to say something a little off topic, which is to respond to something Larry said about when Larry Backhouse said about groups of people where the women don't get to have their voices heard because they're talked over and how he's been helping that when he's in a group. This is something I tell young women and it's something I learned from experience when I showed up at Purdue University. I was the third woman to ever be hired in electrical and computer engineering and the twelfth to be hired in engineering overall. So I was often in a room of all men and I would get talked over. And for those of you who know me well at the university, you're like, how is that possible? She'll talk <laughs> over anyone. But what I tell young women is, what do you do in this situation? And I, and I invented this one day when I was particularly frustrated. And I would, the example is, Bill, thank you so much for re-expressing my ideas such that everyone could appreciate it. <laughs> you get a laugh, and well no done. one ever does it to you again. <laughs> So piece of advice to all the particularly young women in the room, very helpful phrase. Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, everything you're saying here, I can relate to some examples that are exactly the same in business. So before I ask Eliza to, to join us, I would think that in business you also have a woman who tend not to have the confidence to raise their hands when there is a, a new job that comes up, whereas the guy will raise his hand when he has 50% of the requirement. <laughs> um, and uh, pretty uh, uh, similar to what you're explaining in how the project work, uh, Susan, um, when there are two jobs, a job, a job uh, an operational job and a job of staff function administrative, very often, and even if it's well intended, very often we'll put the woman in the staff function or in the staff role or in the function and we'll put the guy in charge of the sales or he has p &L responsibility. And very quickly then you're at a level where, well, you didn't have the operational responsibility but therefore it's a bit too late or you have to go back, back again. So very quickly actually the men have um, positions that are seen as leaders and the female have uh, positions where they are seen as facilitators. So with that, I'd like you, uh, Elisa, to uh, yeah. tell us how you, you work at the foundation uh, with a woman scientist for the award. Yeah, so the, um, the Laurel Foundation, in partnership with UNESCO for now over 20 years, uh, is really working on understanding all these barriers at different uh, life stage and to try to, to to understand um, <coughs> what are the obstacles uh, at childhood until the professional li life stage. And we saw that it's uh, really a combination between different types of culture, uh, the scientific culture, the academic culture, but also the societal culture. And what we see is that globally, there, if there is one barrier that is common at each level, is really the cultural stereotype that consistently represents uh, the ideal engineer um, uh, scientist as a male. 
and there is really a mismatch, a total mismatch between these masculine STEM stereotypes and the gender, uh, the, the role expected uh, for women. Uh, and this creates really a, a, a big barriers for girls and, uh, and women to pursue in STEM. And then uh, we observe different types of barriers at different stages. So when you are entering more in, in, you are in the childhood and uh, uh, adolescent stage, uh, there, is, there are three main barriers. There is the influence of parents that is very important. So parents' expectation uh, really uh, deeply influence the, their children's tra trajectory. Um, and for example, the parents' belief uh, in their children's ability in math or physics uh, really have a, a, an important influence and uh, more than uh, actually their level in math and physics. So uh, we also observe that mother has a, a very important play, uh, a role to play. Um, and the second, uh, the second key barrier of this uh, stage is really the peer acceptance, the influence of peer, because peer acceptance really is a key concern at adolescence. And uh, we see, for example, that uh, the same friend, uh, the same sex friends' uh, interest in math or, uh, or physics uh, really influence uh, adolescent girls to pursue in, mm -hmm. in, the, same, uh, in the same way. Uh, then the, the third that we have also observed at, at this stage is more the abstract side of STEM. So we, we also observe that, uh, for example, uh, girls globally need to uh, connect more with their personal goals and value uh, than boys. So this is also something that we, we can observe. And when you are then at the emerging uh, adulthood, it's uh, other uh, types of barriers. Of course, the, the lack of role models, so we, we already talked about that. Uh, the lack of mentors, but also the, the lack of knowledge uh, of, the, of the field and the college options. So perhaps it's uh, specific in France, but we see uh, actually that they, they don't know, even know exactly uh, what they can do uh, in STEM. And finally, uh, I wanted to, to hand also uh, to hand with the, the professional, professional life stage. Uh, then it's other barrier that is uh, uh, that uh, women are facing, and typically uh, the hi hiring process. So, competence uh, uh, by itself are really not enough for success uh, for women. So it's something that really we 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 observed. Uh, we 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 had a, a study, uh, a quite recent study, where uh, we were comparing uh, not us, but uh, the team were comparing. Uh, uh, exactly the same CV, but by changing only uh, the first name uh, to indicate the gender. And, and we observed that typically the male uh, CV was more uh, competent, seen as more competent, uh, more hireable, and, more, and, and deserving more, uh, more money, <laughs> more, uh, a higher salary. Uh, so this was quite... Um, Shocking, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, and um, there there is also an interesting study analyzing hundreds of letter of recommendation that show that even letter of recommendation are not written in the same way. Wow! So meaning that uh, for the ma the the masculine skills are more on uh, research skills, um, uh, yeah, more on the competence, and uh, for the women, the competence that are. We highlighted are more on teaching skills, practical skills, uh, and personal uh, attributes. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important point I think you're making because we all have our own bias. And yeah. what I'm hearing is that this is, this is one thing where we'll, we'll come later on what we can do, but this is where we really have to pay attention because what you're seeing is that even when people write a recommendation, mm -hmm. they'll unintentionally increase the bias. Yeah. Uh, or, cre or, or add bias uh, towards mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the selection. Um, so that leads me to, uh, to the next question, which is, so what, what can we do about it? Uh, I mean, the World Economic Forum uh, stated that so if you want to reach parity at the stage, it's, uh, it's moving, it's 150 years. So none of us will be here to witness it. <laughs> 
Uh, and since we all think that uh, there is a lot of talent in the humanity and we should tap into the talent, everybody should have equal opportunity. So I'd like to hear from you um, programs or projects that you have put in place or you have witnessed that can help and have helped increasing uh, the diversity or decreasing the um, the loss of female in the different uh, progression during the career. So what can you do to increase the number of uh, female you, you hire or increase the retention? How do you work with that? I don't know who, who wants to start with, uh, with it. I'd like to hear from everyone. Oh. Jill, why don't we go with you? <laughs> so, um, at every organization that I've, I've been a part of, I've paid attention to this in, in, in different ways. As a member of the mathematics department, uh, we, we talk about bias before we embark on evaluation of candidates for hiring of, in positions. Uh, we talk about the importance of mentorship. We talk about the, the differences in letters of recommendation and how to pay attention and how to look for, for gender-based uh, language. Um, in, in the um, research office at Brown, I, I've made uh, training in unconscious bias available to all my staff mm -hmm. and made it a part of their work day and then facilitated discussions afterwards. There are lots, there's lots of data that shows that, that training and habit breaking for, for um, bias is very effective. What's, what's hard is to scale that appropriately. We still need to be able to make effective treatments that don't you know, interventions that don't really require such one-on-one such, uh, -on -one, uh, you know, effort and time. In the American Math Society, I've, I've talked to, to, my, uh, to the ed editorial board committee about the absence of women in decision-making positions on, in, in our top journals in mathematics. And, and this reflects you know, authorship in these journals as well. And if we're not paying attention to this issue, then we're not looking necessarily outside of the personal networks that we form for the very best and most qualified people. And, and when I was the director of Brown's Mathematics Institute, I, I launched with the help of a, of a private uh, donation uh, a program in, in breaking stereotypes called uh, Girls Get Math. It was a one week, it is a one week, non-residential summer day camp that introduced uh, a cohort of young women in high school to the power and beauty of mathematics with uh, computer labs to facilitate visualization and experimentation and simulation. And the target is in the community is math interested high schoolers, not those who are already self-identified you know, as, as definitely going to be math, math uh, majors. And most of the instructors and the leaders are female, which, again, is breaking the stereotype of who is a math professor and who is a math graduate student. And the feedback from this program attests to, to the high impact of learning mathematics in a female-friendly environment how to scale something like this, right? This is for the community around Brown University. And, and this was always the plan, and it's been realized in the last couple of years as we, um, as we get more, um, more funding to provide a train the teacher program, to train other people to do a girls get math in their own community. So although it's a small step, I think if a national program like this uh, actually emerges, it would have a big impact. Mm -hmm. And is that, uh, I'll go back to you, Carla, because you also have a program for women um, uh, who have not studied computer science. Uh, that, so I feel that bringing the girls to a field where they would naturally not go, the encouragement is, uh, is actually helping. Can you talk about it? Yeah, so if you think about it, right now we're leaving it in the hands of 17-year-olds who goes into tech. I don't know if you remember when you were 17 or if you have children who are 17, that doesn't seem like a very responsible decision that we're making as a world. Um, I personally headed off to college and in a fit of rebellion, instead of majoring in math, decided to major in English <laughs> because my father kept suggesting I major in math and I wanted to choose my own major. Thankfully, I discovered computer science because I wasn't very good at English. Um, 
So the programs that, that we've been developing um, at Northeastern are about how do we create more pathways to computer science that don't rely on a 17-year-old making this decision. And the first I'm going to mention is called the Align Masters in Computer Science. This is a master's for people who studied anything other than computer science. So for all of you that are thinking about more education, we have people from English, from philosophy, from chemistry. And we, we grew this program and we watched it for three years to make sure it would work. Would the graduates of this program do as well in the job market as people who had gone in a traditional path? And I'm happy to say that they do. We um, have seen 100% employment um, of our graduates. And most recently, we did a grade distribution analysis to see how did these people fare when they get into the classes with the regular master's students. And I'm proud to say that these aligned students are slightly higher in their grades. Mm -hmm. So how does the program work? You come in and you do two semesters of preparatory work. Think about if you had gone to college for English and now you want to be a doctor, you have to do pre-med. So it's like pre-computer science. It's not quite an undergraduate education. And in fact, we very carefully curate what concepts you really need to have seen before you get to the master's level of coursework. Coupled with a um, co-op experience through our experiential learning, which builds the confidence of people. Um, and we are on the road to scaling this program to being 1,000 students um, per year at Northeastern. We're also growing an online component. Mm -hmm. But equally importantly, we are, through the um, generosity of, 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 of uh, a few companies, scaling this program and, and showing the rest of um, universities how to grow their own masters in computer science for people who didn't study computer science. So we formed the Align Consortium of other universities that are going to be offering this program. And the first members of this are um, Columbia, Georgia Tech, and um, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And we're adding more members. And the goal here is to make a master's in computer science like an MBA mm -hmm. or a JD or an MD, something you can do after any undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. This increases both the diversity of thought and the diversity of demographics in tech. And if you think about every single person in here uses tech all the time, what would things have looked like if they were created by a more diverse population? <laughs> Quickly, the second yeah. thing we're working on is um, we were just um, given a wonderful gift from the executive office of Melinda Gates, who's passionate about lifting women up. If you haven't read her recent book, The Moment of Lift, it's very inspiring. She gave us a large gift to take what we've done at the undergraduate level and help other universities both recruit and retain women. So we've gone from 18% to 30% in our undergraduate population. And I can tell you, I can put any professor on that intro sequence that believes that there's a geek gene and kill off everybody's interest, but disproportionately kill off the interest of women. So we'll be giving grants to other universities to help them realize a large percentage increase in both the retention and the attraction of women um, to tech. So these are both national efforts. And I, I really, I have to say what you're talk, say, saying about the um, having more women in, in tech, because you're working so much on AI, one of my personal worry with AI is all these bias that are creating, because all these algorithms, you know, we all think it's all objective and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you can trust it because it comes from uh, large data analytics. There are a lot of uh, human brains behind it. If they are all human brains of young guys, it's like the orchestra in the old days when they were recruiting only guys and it totally changed the day they decided to have this um, recruitment behind a curtain. Right now in the orchestra, most of the, them are recruiting with a curtain and it totally changed the way you were you're recruiting. So I, I think that is actually absolutely critical now that everybody is building all these algorithms, that we have more women that are building them so that we can reflect the diversity of uh, opinion. So maybe I'll start with, uh, with well, I'll continue with you, Eliza, yeah. uh, before having uh, Susan's view. Uh, 
What about so in, the program? In terms of, of action, of course, uh, it's my daily life uh, to work on, <laughs> on this topic and to put in place action for women in science. Uh, so we are, uh, our program are mainly well known for the, their awards. So of course we, uh, uh, we highlight role models and we make them, we give them a very high visibility. So we have awards uh, for five exceptional uh, women scientists uh, all around the world. So one, one per continent every year. And we have also a program of fellowship uh, in uh, now 118 uh, countries. Uh, to encourage uh, young women scientists uh, to, to pursue, to pursue their, their research. But today I wanted to mention perhaps two actions that we have, uh, we have had it last year. The one f on, on how we work on internal bias. Uh, so it's the leadership training. So we have uh, decided now when you, you are becoming a Laurel UNESCO fellows, uh, we offer you a training. Uh, and we train them on, on soft skills, so meaning on personal development, team management, negotiation, uh, media coaching, and social media to also accelerate their visibility uh, and their self-confidence. And it's a tremendous uh, success. It's incredible. Uh, really, we have feedbacks that are very, uh, very good. They say that they, 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 we save five to 10 years in their career. And it's for all the nominees? It's, uh, it's, it's for nominee. all the winners. Okay. All the winners. Of course, all the countries uh, do not have the enough money to, to put it in place, but uh, we are now developing a digital, digital training to make it open to everyone. Um, and the second uh, key action that we have uh, decided to launch uh, last year, it's our main coalition. So we have decided to, uh, to join our force because at the end, uh, as it was mentioned, we are uh, only uh, 11 at leading positions, so meaning that uh, the rest is male. Uh, so we wanted, and, and it's just, and this is also one message that I wanted to, to give to you is, it's not uh, a program for women for women, uh, mm -hmm. okay? So we are working for that to, for a, a common benefits. So, and if, and, and, and if this really we, we, we succeed in, uh, in, in, in raising awareness on the impact and the, the, uh, that the, to have more women in science is beneficial for all, and then we, mm -hmm. perhaps it will be uh, uh, quicker. And so just to finish the men coalition, the objective is really to gather men at leading position to help us to move the lines uh, in their institution and university. And uh, Professor Alain Fuchs is uh, uh, one of our active members for the French coalition. And, and so we co-create recommendations for universities. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important point you're making because I've been working on uh, uh, increasing the women's development and retention for 20 years. And at the beginning, we were doing that a lot through women's network and between women. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the companies were very happy to leave that to women, which is, yeah. well, help yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in the end, for the men in the room, we're not going to change it just... Uh, within the women, right? We have uh, we have to have everybody uh, work on this. Yeah, because the benefit is for also Ab men. It's not uh, absolutely only for us. Susan, your point of view. Well, we have to start with the fact that I have not been the leader of an organization, <laughs> and that is not how I do it. Okay. So I'm a scholar mm -hmm. and a teacher, and so most of the my contributions in this area are what. I, the research I do and how I teach about it. But for the two years prior, ending in June, this past June, I was chair of the MIT faculty. And I decided that when I was asked to take this role, that I was going to make it a bully pulpit mm. and use it to say everything I wanted to say that I thought would improve MIT and improve the conditions for women and others. So I um, try to speak. I see one of my male colleagues sitting here watching to see what I say. But he's one of the leaders, I have to say, of this movement as well. That um, I organized lunches and dinners for all the women faculty. So it doesn't deal with this issue of the men, except being in their face all the time. It's very important. Um, 
And I, and at these lunches and dinners, it became a vehicle for women to meet other women across the campus who they didn't really know. And what was reported back to me is that they found research opportunities, they found women they didn't really know. So I took the job I had and just a little bit could bring, there are 1,066 faculty at MIT, there are 260 women faculty. There are only, there are only uh, 21 women of color faculty. Okay, let's get the proportion mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to say something about what my research, and not only mine, m other sociologists and anthropologists know about how hard it is to change culture. And one of the reasons is most people think that culture is sort of like the air we breathe. We know it, but we, that's it. We can't say it, we don't know what, how it works. We're not all biologists and chemists and physicists to know how the air works. But what anthropologists and sociologists and other social scientists know is that culture is not like the ether. It's not just a random assortment mm -hmm. of preferences, as our colleagues in economics would like us to believe. It is patterned, and culture is a system. It is an organized system of signs and practices. And it is because it is systemic, system, systematic, there is a systematicity, there's a pattern to it, we can identify that. And once we identify it, well then we can address the particular mechanisms, which is what my colleagues and you on the panel are doing. You have identified places where there can be a little bit of change. But if we talk about culture like, oh, we just have to do better, it's just people's values, we're not going to change. We have to look at the distribution of resources, the embedded messages that associate not only genius with, with male, but merit with male. I have a colleague at, at Sloan, Emilio Castilla, and one of our former students, Aruna Ranganathan, have a beautiful paper coming out where they have showed that when you ask in businesses managers to give out the salary raises on the basis of merit, women get less of a raise. And when Emilio first discovered that, he, he, he came and discussed it with the rest of us, and basically I said to him, you have, that's a cultural problem. And he, for the last five years, has been tracing how these associations between merit and male are made. The paper's coming out soon, and that's the kind of thing that we can do mm -hmm. and try to explain the story. One last thing to come full circle with what Jill said to begin with, when we tell the story of, of a field or of an occupation or of creativity as an individual story, whether it be of genius, you know, or a single person made a difference, we tell what, what I call a hegemonic tale. It's the great man story, the great woman story. But if you want to tell a liberatory story, a story that will help people to become freer and more able and more accomplished, then you have to identify the mechanisms in each of the organizations and settings which turn these things on and off. Mm -hmm. And so I just, my contribution is just to teach about that and to write about that and try to explain what mechanisms in what organizations have to be turned on and off. Which is and these are the ladies and you who will do it. <laughs> this is a great contribution because you probably analyze well what we are trying to do and it is going to take a lot of effort to move it. Um, I can maybe add a little bit from the, uh, the company's perspective, uh, the things that a lot of good companies who have better diversity do, but also what they face. Um, I, I find that what is the most impactful is really forcing the diversity on the slates. Whenever you have a candidate, you know, and I've led that for, I mean, 20 years ago, uh, I remember sitting on, um, 
on uh, performance review with organizational review and asking the managers, but you don't have women in your slates. When the company, and that was the, my time at GE, when the company was forcing the managers to have women in the slates, initially they would say, we don't have any. Okay, well, you don't fill the, the, the position. You send them back. Last week, I heard a friend of mine who was telling me that now they force uh, the managers having the percentage of the, their own population. So let's say, for example, in pharmaceutical companies, you have 50 plus percent of the employees who are women. You go to the last top level, two, two, two top levels. I don't know what it is on average, but it's between 10 and 20 percent max. If you force the number of women on the slates, it forces the manager to look for their best female. And what my friend was telling me is that, and then you realize that actually you have a good representation. If you have 40% women on the slates, you have 40% on the next stage. What you have to be careful though, they were explaining, is that no matter how many program you put in place, you have to watch for the lateral, what they call the lateral hiring, which is, even if a company has a very good entry-level program where they will make sure that they have 50% female, 50% male, then they realize that at junior level, suddenly they have less women. So they initially thought it was an attrition problem, but when I digged into it, they thought that actually, yes, there was a little bit of attrition that was slightly higher for female than for male, but the reality was that this lateral hiring between three, four, five, seven, between three and, five, and seven years um, of experience, what was happening is that the female were head down, looking at delivering the best job they could, very loyal. The company loved them. They're doing their job, they're loyal, they're not worried. The guys starting to connect and discuss between them, how much do you make, what do you do? And because they're, they're in the competition, they actually were aware of new openings before there was even an open hiring. And actually it was this lateral hiring that was uh, uh, cutting down their, their dilution. And I found that really impressive. Of course it is in a company that was trying to make it the best, but you really have to dig very deep to understand what is happening. And there is not a single place uh, where you're going to resolve the whole, uh, the whole issue. So as a transition, I think that one thing I, I wanted to also um, uh, talk about is that we're not going to move it if, if we are not conscious on a day-to-day -day basis, all of us, everyone in the room, about what we can do. So I'd like to ask everyone on the panel, what is your call for action for the people in the room? Do you want to start, okay, Carla? Sir. My, oh, um, oh, my okay. call for action is to um, find a, a woman um, who is maybe not that happy in their career um, and tell them to go get a master's in computer science at a growing number of schools. <laughs> right now we're at 46 percent women um, and um, all of the schools that have joined the consortium have as one of their goals to try to reach the population norms. So I would encourage you to personally find a woman and encourage her to go to one of these programs. <laughs> Okay. Very good. Susan? Well, I want to say that, uh, that women should not be silent and they shouldn't be reticent about naming and calling out what they see in front of them. Uh, and whether it's differential treatment or it's being silenced, stand up and uh, speak out. Because lots of things happen because we're bystanders. Mm -hmm. Because we say, well, look, it happened again. But you have to create sisterhood in that regard, and there are many men who want to join the sisterhood. Uh, so I would say that people should speak out and point out the problems. The, uh, Can I say speak out for the others? That's it right. It's very hard no, to no. speak out for No, speak out for the other. Yeah. It, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and build the networks of women to help them. You don't, we never do this alone. We always do it with the help of others, and we should reach out. My, my husband was a scientist at MIT, and I learned a lot of how to succeed from him. He was head of me. 
And he always told me, be nice to everybody on the way up so they'll be nice to you on the way down. <laughs> and I think that's the way we should do it. It's very Thank good. You. Jill, your call so to action. By, by middle school, uh, more than twice as many boys as girls uh, think of um, mathematics as a, as a boy thing as, and, and are more inclined to, to major, uh, to, to take classes in math and science. And, and so I, I, my call to action is to pay attention to children. If, you're in the, if you are in a position to, to affect a, child, a child's judgment or attitudes or knowledge about, about the opportunities in various fields, to, to pay attention to the children. Yes. Very good. Hey, yeah, Lisa? I was about uh, almost to say the same, but uh, I would say perhaps um, my call to action would be to uh, to re really know the fact behind the, this topic, so to really dig into a little bit more about the research bias that there is uh, be behind, and to and to explain to other, because I think perhaps it is an issue for us. We are all uh, aware about the problem, but it's not the case for everyone. And when you come with factual uh, elements. Uh, some facts, scientific base, uh, showing that these uh, have a big impact on the scientific excellence mm -hmm. and the research, then it's something yeah. that can yeah. be very yeah. useful. So before I ask for questions, I leave you um, two minutes to think about it. Uh, I'll actually have my own call uh, for action. So for the young ladies in the room, encourage each other to raise your hand, to go for a position uh, that you think are challenging. Because the boys will go for it even if they are not ready. We talked about it, so encourage each other. For anybody in the room who is in a position to recruit or hire or make decision on promoting a woman or, or anyone, whether it's in the field of business, science, technology, Think about and read, educate yourself about all these bias and try to decode what, what you're seeing. Women m might need a little bit more encouragement. Men might uh, jump for it a bit too fast. But actually think about what you will gain from a more diverse group, um, whether it is in your company, whether it is in your uh, studies. But really call it out. And last, I'd like to reinforce the sisterhood and the jumping it, watch out and, and uh, spell it out when you sit. Look around and spell it out when you sit. With that, I'm looking for the first volunteer for the first question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I can't see. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. That was fascinating. Uh, my name is Serena Perrick. I'm a professor in the philosophy department here at Northeastern. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about stereotype threat and one dimension of it that I'm aware of is that in mentioning a stereotype, like don't be biased against women for, you know, based on merit, it deepens the bias. So it alerts the people who are the victims of the stereotype that, oh, that they should be worried and they do less well on tests and things once they're reminded of it. And then it deepens the bias in people who you're trying to make it aware of. So I've, I've just been struggling this recently and I wondered if you had any insights about how to deal with that dimension of the problem. Carla, do you want to talk a little bit about what we do in, in the program that I mentioned, the Aligned Masters in Computer Science? We have a lot of co-curricular programming where we bring in lots and lots of role models who may be to talk about what they do and to talk about their journey. And we specifically look for people who took a non-traditional path. It's not enough. Um, we also do mentoring. We have um, a mentoring network. Um, and that's not enough either, but those are the things that we've thought about so far that appear to really help with retention. I think one thing that also helps is that everybody is in the program together starting on an even playing field. Um, and it's really difficult if you come into something where you feel like it's uneven, which would be the case with our freshmen, 
where some people have gone to a high school that has wonderful computer science and some people didn't have computer science at their high school, or if they did, we wish they hadn't taken it because it was so abysmal. And there's ways to do it at that level as well, um, where uh, one example of this is to create a class where people self-select into it because they think they know more. They don't end up at a different place. We just make it sort of arbitrarily hard so they feel really good about the fact that they were <laughs> accelerated. But that leaves the people who haven't had anything before in this field together feeling comfortable mm -hmm. to ask questions at a level that they might not if they were sitting next to uh, a young gentleman uh, in class who, thinking that this was going to be appealing, talks about how he's been coding since he was in diapers and, and would you like to go on a date with me? And it doesn't usually go over that well. Yeah. So those are just some examples. Yeah. Jill, you wanted to add something? So on the mathematics portion of the SAT, if you identify your gender before taking the exam, um, females will do worse. This is, a, this, this is the kind of study and research that shows the effect of stereotype threat. It's interesting to me, I mean, philosophy, I think, is another field that also has this cult of, of genius. Um, there, there are, it's the one field of humanities that is very underrepresented by women in the academy. And that's, I think, a, a function of, of this, this that, it, that is a field, one of these fields where people feel that there has to be some born, you know, some special gift, something that you're not just learning. I, I would uh, I, I would encourage I would encourage you and other people in, in underrepresented fields to 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 form mentorship net, networks and to look for mentors. For me, I, I, you know, mentorship was a really important aspect of, of the, my success in my career. I had two mentors at an early stage in my career, both men, but both were we're looking out for me, we're making sure I got an invitation to the important conference to present my results to the leaders in the field, or looking out when I did not get and my and my next job the same uh, salary offer or I mean they, they were people that I could turn to mm -hmm. so there's there's really I think mentorship is a valuable thing and and if you don't automatically have a mentor try to find something like this at, at, at your um, at your university I, I can't refrain from uh, doubling down on this yeah. I think that uh, I was very lucky I always felt that I did the career I did because I was working for GE at a time they had decided that it was a business initiative, that the business needed to change. And uh, they put in, the company put in place the mentoring program and uh, decided to develop women, but giving opportunities to women. Shall I um, take one more question, unless there is some pressing addition you wanted to make? Um, yes, over there. Hi. I'm Chloe from MIT. Um, my question is, I've heard in this panel and the previous one too, um, that women maybe have different center of interests, uh, maybe more social or more goal oriented. That's what I've heard, I think, this morning. Uh, and so does that mean that education and science education in particular should be adapted to women? Um, maybe by having different type of content in the classes, or even having more uh, women-only classes. So it's, or on the contrary, is it would that increase stereotype? Yeah. Susan, Susan, I'm tempted to ask you that question. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, I really don't know what to say. Um, I. I, I no? I okay. don't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Elisa, do you have any uh, ideas? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's an inter interesting question. I think uh, it depends also on the country. For example, in France, if, if you, there is so many fights to have mixity uh, into school, then if you go back uh, uh, and you try to separate women to, to men, it increases stereotypes for sure. But what we are uh, working on and discussing with different stakeholders is uh, how we can find in, in this context uh, where school has to be mixed and, uh, and to, be, uh, uh, yeah, to be mixed, uh, how we can find also some specific moment uh, where girls can be 
just together to exchange, to connect, because they need also this, uh, this moment of girls only. So mm -hmm. it's something on which, for example, for all the program for girls in science, we are thinking about how we can also uh, uh, reserve some uh, some moments specifically for girls, but probably not at school. At school, I don't know. The, in the United States, uh, yeah. it's perhaps so, different. So um, before I give it, yeah. I give it back to you, Susan. Actually, um, Elisa, you, what you're um, saying actually reminds me that when 20 years ago I started being engaged in in this women's network uh, activity in companies, it's true that at the beginning, um, it was helpful to have just women because otherwise they would not have come to the events that we were doing. So there was this balance that we need to, to do. And I remember very vividly one day we wanted to open it for men and men saw the opportunity right and loud, but overnight we had 80% men and the women disappeared. Yeah. So it was quite interesting yeah. finding, Find this, the balance uh, finding this right balance. Yeah. Susan? Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I was thinking about it, and it, you, you've basically said it. I'm sorry. That, that's okay. That um, uh, one of the things we know is that networking groups matter and support groups matter. And uh, it could, but we also know from the data in the United States that the women's colleges, like Wellesley and Smith, some used to be right, pro produced a high number of very successful women by being in these women only environments for a certain time. So then it's, as you suggested, if you can make small groups within the larger organization in which you can support each other, that sort of balances mm -hmm. the issues. Mm -hmm. You see it much better than I did. No, no. Do I have time for another question? Mm -hmm. or No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't see if it's a yes or a no. <laughs> OK, so um, I will finish by thanking everyone in the audience and thanking uh, Northeastern University and the French Consulate for putting together this uh, great event. And thank you for having us on board. And to my fellow panelists, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if you are not in a seat, I invite you to take a seat at the table. And lunch will be served shortly. Thank you.